Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our text this morning is fascinating. It weaves together the story of a woman who's suffering, a young girl who is dying, and Jesus Christ. We find this woman is desperate after 12 years of suffering. And she reaches out to try to receive healing from the simple touch of Jesus. And we find a father who is equally desperate throwing himself at the feet of Jesus, begging for him to heal his daughter. And Jesus, in the midst of this, offers up this simple phrase of teaching. Do not fear, only believe. It's a message that we can cling to in life, in suffering, and even in death. Do not fear. Fear, only believe. It's the first layer and initial teaching of the gospel. It's the one thing on the surface that we can take from this story about the place of fear and the power of faith. Would you say it with me? Do not fear, only believe. Now in a sense I could stop the sermon and we could go home. Because that's the message. But I think the gospel wants us to dig deeper into what that faith looks like and what it means. I think it wants us to dig deeper to understand another message about what that faith drives us to and brings into our life. And in order to do that, we have to understand the context of the story. When we get the context the text begins to flower forth with more beauty. So this is first century Palestine. And in first century Palestine, the patriarchy, patriarchy, the lifting up of men and the diminishing of women is thick and overwhelming. It's a system that teaches women that they are near worthless. They are property, they are unclean, they are powerless and disgusting. It's a system that is meant to build up men and oppress women. Patriarchy. Within that context, we see this particular woman who is suffering with what the text calls bleeding hemorrhaging. Now what we understand with our better knowledge of medical realities of our human body that she is almost certainly suffering with a disease called menorrhagia. Please don't look that up. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. Menorrhagia, right? It's a particular disease for women that has to do with heavy, prolonged, or continual bleeding in their period. And so what this woman is dealing with is a disease that essentially prolongs her period throughout almost all of her life. Right? Now why this is important within the first century Palestine is that the law teaches this culture that a woman during her period is unclean. And because she's unclean, she must set herself aside and apart from the community and she cannot be touched. No human contact. For if she is touched, then the person who touches her becomes unclean. And they must set themselves aside from the community. Now, it's during your period that you're unclean, but the law also says that after you have finished your period, you must spend seven days ritually cleansing yourself, and after the seven days, then you will be clean. 
you can come back into the community and you can be touched. Now imagine this woman's life. For 12 years, she's been dealing with this annoying, irritating, and oftentimes painful disease. But on top of it, this patriarchal law has isolated and debilitated her so that she has not been touched for 12 years. Do you have a better sense of the kind of suffering that she's going through? How desperate she must have been? Now not only is that the context, but in addition to that, this system of patriarchy has lifted up physicians. We would call them quacks. <laughs> who are selling snake oil to the desperate because she just wants to be in the community. And so she not only is isolated and untouched, she has spent every dime she has. And so now she's thrust into poverty. All because a system says that this disease she never chose or never did anything to do of her own has labeled her unclean, untouchable, unfit for community. That, my brothers and sisters, is patriarchy. Now what deeper lessons can this text begin to teach us then as we look at it and study it in light of this context. Now when I begin to study and look at Scripture, let me give you a little clue or hint about how pastors start to read, right? I've shared with this before. We look for words. Words that have impact or that jump out at us in the text. And oftentimes we're looking for words that repeat. Because when they repeat, it tells us that the author, in this case Mark, is trying to focus us on a particular place. Now there's a set of words in this story that repeat multiple times. And the first one we're going to look at is immediately. Immediately is repeated three times in this text. And I believe that Mark is taking this word of action immediately to draw our attention to what he wants to teach us. The first time, two times that immediately is used is verse 29 and 30. Right? And so we see in verse 29 these words, immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now think about what this means for this woman. Twelve years of being untouched, of being isolated and debilitated, of being thrust into poverty, and immediately she is well. Now think about what she had to do for that immediately to come. With her faith, she needed to wage into a crowd of people and reach out and grasp Jesus and say, He will make me well. Her actions are confrontational to the system of patriarchy. She is saying with her faith, I will not be held down. I will not be held out. I will not be held back any longer. I will be well. And no system will keep me from having it. And immediately, she's healed. And then verse 30 comes along, and it's really interesting, right? Because the, it's, it's not enough for Mark to show us her confrontational faith against the system. 
he must also show us Jesus' reaction. So immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? I want you to think about this for a minute, right? Jesus is in a crowd of people and he knows better than all of us what has happened. He knows that someone who is unclean has been healed. He knows that this woman who has flouted all the norms, all the rules, has disregarded the teaching of Scripture to confront with faith what she wanted and needed. He knows better than anyone. And he stops and he says, I will not move until I see who has touched me. He doesn't have to do this for her to be healed. You see that, right? She's already healed. Her hemorrhage has stopped. She's well. All she needs to do, slink away, ritually cleanse herself for seven days, and everything that she wanted is hers. She's back in the community. She can be touched. She can live her life again in wholeness. She believes that she has gotten everything she needs from Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm stopping. I'm not moving because there's one more thing you need. And you know what? I think Mark is saying, we all need to hear it too. Because listen to this. What Jesus is doing is putting her life at risk. Scripture is very clear. It's very direct in what it teaches. He should chastise her. He should condemn her. He should call her out because her confrontational faith of weeding into the crowds to touch Him has made everyone unclean. She has flouted the norms and the rules and the clear teaching of Scripture. Do you wonder why she finally comes forward and Mark tells us that she comes with fear and trembling? What will he say? What will he do? What will he take from the Scriptures and the law and crush her with it? And what does Jesus say? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed from your disease. Now why does Jesus need to say this? Because He wants to lift up her confrontational faith and tell her, well done, good and faithful servant. Go in peace. She's already healed. She's already got the disease wiped out. She needs to hear that her faith, her striving against the system that would oppress her, her unwillingness to be held back, to be held out, to shut away, that is lifted up by Jesus and said, that faith, that faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now if that were not enough, there's a third immediately, right? There's a third immediately because Jesus isn't done teaching us about the power of systems and the confrontational faith that we must address to overcome them, break them apart and destroy them. So verse 42 says, And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. Now we know this story. Jairus has come in desperation to seek healing for his daughter who he knows is on death's door. 
and he's too late. Jesus is too late. And she's died. And the people say, don't bother with Jesus anymore. She's dead. And what does Jesus say? Do not fear. Only believe. What kind of belief is he asking of Jairus? Meek, quiet, calm faith. Faith that sits in the pews on Sunday and doesn't bother with the rest of the culture? Is that the kind of faith that will overcome death? No. No. He's asking Jairus to embrace a confrontational faith. A faith that says, death, you will not have the last word. A gospel faith. You see, this young girl is suffering under the same systems of oppression that this this older woman is suffering under. And she may be facing death, but those same systems of patriarchy live over her as well. In fact, the Scriptures say that because she's sick and because she's dead, you can't touch her or you become unclean. And just like Jesus needs to offer forth a lifting up of the confrontational faith of this woman who was bleeding, He now needs to confront the system Himself. And what does He do with this little girl? He reaches out and takes her hand. And He says, get up. Now I think that this little girl and this woman are intricately connected. And I've told you the immediately's now, but let me show you what Mark is also doing. Mark is a brilliant author, right? How old is this young girl? How long has this woman been suffering with bleeding? Their lives are intricately connected. Their lives are speaking of one. Of the suffering of women under a system that would hold them down in isolation or in death. And Jesus says, just like I came to heal you and encourage your confrontational faith, I've come to overcome death and encourage a confrontational faith. But there's even more, right? Mark is so brilliant. There's even more, right? Jairus comes to Jesus and who is he? He's the ruler of the synagogue, right? The ruler of the synagogue. His job is to make sure that the system continues to work and run. His job is to make sure that the patriarchy is followed. And what does he do? He comes and he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, Save my daughter. The system tells him what about his daughter? How much is she worth? She's property and she's broken. She's about to die. But what does a father do? He falls at Jesus' feet and desperately cries out for his daughter. You see, because we can have systems that try to tell us what people are worth and what their value is and how they belong or don't belong, but in relationships of love, when we see our daughter hurting and broken, Our heart breaks and we abandon the system. What value does it have? And we fall at the feet of Jesus and with love we say, please save my daughter. How much was she worth to Him? Yeah, infinite value. And that's the truth of a relationship of love beyond a system that tries to tell us what people are worth. And who belongs and who doesn't. So how does this connect us to the woman? What does Jesus say to her? When she finally comes forward with fear and trembling, what does he say to her? Daughter. Daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Do you see how they're connected? Do you see what Jesus is trying to teach us about confronting systems that diminish people and lifting up love and faith and relationship? Because this young girl and this older woman are both 
daughters of God and both deserve life and freedom and hope and to be broken out of the shackles. And so Jesus sets them both free. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, Thank you, Pastor Rodney. What a stirring, stirring teaching. And I love to hear about how awful the first century was with their bad culture. But we don't think that way anymore, right? We know that men and women are equal. And we treasure them both equal. And patriarchy isn't a part of our culture, right? Really? Let me offer you a video this morning. I encourage you to just listen to it. I asked a hundred women to give me one word to describe their bodies. Wobbly, imperfect, stumpy, very average, short, I'd like to be thinner. <laughs> Not perfect. I need to lose weight. Wait, I don't like this body right now. Not nice to look at. Maybe I'm a little bit fat. It's like frumpy. It's kind of gross. I hate it. I feel disgusting. <laughs> I feel disgusting. Disgusting. I was watching Michaela play. Disgusting. Disgusting. They were describing their bodies. I need to lose weight. Stocky. Frumpy. Disgusting. Where do women hear these messages? What system teaches our daughters that they're somehow disgusting? And what would Jesus say to all of us this morning? I think he'd step forward immediately <laughs> and say, daughters, I love you. You are a child of God. You are redeemed. You are beautiful. You are valuable. You are worthy. I think Jesus would reach out and want to grab all of our hands, particularly our women's hands, and say, get up. Don't sit in the corner. Don't isolate yourself. Don't imagine the worst of who you are. But claim you are a child of God. Beautiful. Wonderful. Grace-filled. I think Jesus would say to each of our women this morning, your faith, your confrontational faith, your confrontation to any system that would call you worthless has made you well. Do not fear, only believe. Unless we think this is just a message for our women this morning. I think that's what Jesus would leave us with from where we started. Do not fear. For you men out there, if we lift up our women, it does not mean we will be diminished. If we share power and leadership, it does not mean that we will be subjected. If we step aside from the spotlight and allow them to have the center stage, it does not mean that we're somehow less. It might just mean that we're Christ-like. 
So when we face a system that oppresses, that demeans, that tells the vulnerable or the weak that they must be down or out or away, we must have faith. Do not fear. Only believe. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you challenge us with the depth and complexity of the gospel. If what we need to hear this morning is that we should set aside our fear and simply follow Jesus with faith, then help us to receive that by the power of your Spirit. If what we need to hear this morning is that the systems that tell us that we are ugly or fat or stocky or stumpy or worthless or as good as dead, help us to set that aside and hear the message that we are children of God, daughters of God, sons of God, and that you love us deeply. If what we need to hear this morning is that we need to sit down and shut up as men so that women can step forward, then give us that word. Help us, Lord, in whatever we hear this morning, not to give in to fear, but to believe to confront systems, to overturn oppression, to be people in our communities and our homes and our church who are welcoming the stranger, lifting up the vulnerable, and stepping aside so that other voices might be raised. Remind us again, O Lord, do not fear. Only believe. In your holy name we pray. Amen.